Hi, everybody. This is Josh um, from Manhattan Edit Workshop, bringing you Sight, Sound, and Story live. Um, and it's a nice night. It was a snowy night in New York City. Um, we're looking at uh, talking to colors. The title of our program tonight is Making the Grade. And um, we want to thank our sponsors, as we normally do, OWC, Zeiss, Ace, and Shutterstock. Thank you guys for making this event possible. In addition, I'd like to thank the crew, uh, personnel at Manhattan Edit Workshop, Jason Banky, Janet Dalton, and Tristan Ledwidge for making my job very easy. All I have to do is plug in a set of headphones, hope that my internet connection holds up and, uh, and, and do my thing for a minute and a half. Um, but as I always like to say, these are the, the, um, the events that make the job uh, really worthwhile when we get to take a break from uh, learning about the buttons that we push in the interface controls and things like that and, and really get to focus on uh, all of the concepts behind that, which is, you know, telling stories and, and the why of editing and sound design and, and in tonight's instance, color correction. So I'm going to back out of the way. I usually say in, in these events at the beginning that things may go wrong. Hopefully they won't. Um, knock on wood, they, they've gone really well so far, but uh, as with anything uh, in technology that we're using, something could happen. If it does, stand by. Um, we will bring you back as soon as we can if we have any problems that, that cause the show to drop out. Usually doesn't happen. Um, please ask your questions in the sidebar chat in the Vimeo player. Um, we do our best to gather those questions and then send them over to our panel so that they can answer them at the end of the show, which we'll do at the after they've done, you know, done and speaking and, and showing clips of their work. Um, if you want to be uh, identified, let us know. We can certainly add your names to the questions, um, but uh, I'm, I'm just here to introduce them so that you guys can enjoy a great night. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna bring in Jason Druss, Stefan Nakamura, and Elodie Eshter, uh, Eshter. I did, I told you I was gonna mispronounce something there. I tried my best, I went two for three. So I'm gonna bow out of this conversation and I'm gonna let you hop in as soon as I see, there you go. Uh, have a great uh, event guys and I will be back to close out soon. Thank you very much. Awesome, great, thanks so much. And thank you so much, uh, Stefan and Elodie. I'm so excited to have a conversation with you both. Um, happy holidays to both of you. You too. You too. Um, the first question I think we're going to uh, kick off to uh, Stefan. Um, the first thing I think uh, we'd like to talk about is uh, artificial intelligence or AI. Um, generally, this year we've seen some new kind of AI tools creep their way into our industry. Um, some folks like Dado Valentic um, have been creating some software packages, um, so software applications and plugins for DaVinci Resolve and other apps that are bringing artificial intelligence, things like shot matching for, for dailies and all kinds of other applications to color correction. Now, what does that mean for us as colorists um, trusting a uh, computer application to do a job that normally we'd trust to ourselves? But more importantly, aside from these tools that'll obviously get better and more accurate over time when it comes to user feedback and updates, the more important thing I'd like to talk about is what does it mean as this software gets better to uh, to color assists, and what does it mean to young people coming up the ladder um, as, uh, as they compete for these really precious jobs to learn how to become a colorist? What does it mean for them? Um, I think people shouldn't be afraid of AI. Um, I think it could really help our industry, like it can in almost every aspect of life. Um, I'll give you a perfect example of how this could work. Uh, you could have a scene that was shot, let's just say, at 12 o'clock in the afternoon and you've got blue sky and then you're cutting to a shot that has white sky and then you're cutting back and the next shot cutting back to the the first the first character has white sky and the next one gets blue sky well you could set a look for one character and instead of look for another character and have a match but then you're basically telling a computer make sure that this matches exactly. And what could happen is that it could make the skies match, but then it doesn't look right for the particular shot because of the way the light is falling on the characters. In which case we would go in, you know, maybe set a look and say, hey, I'm gonna have blue skies throughout this whole scene. And then as we keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into the sequence, we start looking at the shots and say, hey, you know, the shots with the white sky 
that actually looks a little bit better. So I think I'm going to make this whole scene just have white sky instead of blue sky. And you start changing your minds halfway through the halfway through the scene. And so as a result, you really, um, you know, you have to basically be able to change your mind at any time and have the computer basically change with you. So in that respect, you know, if there was a way that an artificial intelligence computer could help us match better, quicker, that would be great, but still doesn't take away the creative aspects of it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Elodie, what do, you, what do you think on the topic of AI um, slowly making its way into color correction and post-production at large? Yeah, I think it, exactly what uh, Stephen just said, that at, at, at one point you still need the artistic eye to, to do the job and the final job. Now it might be, it's, it's the first version of it, it's pretty new, it might have good and bad right now, it's going to get better. Uh, it can be very helpful for, I, I'm thinking about smaller production that can't afford to have a daily colorist on set. So at least they can have someone that do one shot and the rest will kind of match, which might be better than just having just a one lot. So it can help little production to that extent. Um, now again, I'm curious to see it. I haven't seen the work that they do. I truly believe that the human eye is also something that the computer can't replace because I can make decision on grading based on the feeling or based on perfect matching. And that is up to me. The system will not, you know, I don't think right now there's a system that tells you, that can be, oh, this is just from feeling that I want to match, or this is from skin tone. All right, great. And um, both of you uh, prepared a few clips from movies that you've um, previously graded that you brought here with you tonight to, uh, to share with everyone, correct? Yes. yes. Awesome, awesome. Should we uh, start uh, start the um, the talk off by uh, checking out those um, trailers and clips and uh, talking about them a bit? Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome, great. Um, should we start with uh, uh, Stefan because you're you're going to do a screen share, correct? Yeah, I'll do a screen share. So um, the clip I'm going to show you came from it chapter two uh, that I color corrected. And this particular um, scene is basically um, I'll, I'll set this up for you. It's this character Richie as an adult, and he is sort of having a, a flashback to, to him as a child, um, seeing a statue come to life, and that nightmarish experience of going through that. And then basically what happens is he comes back into his world, and then he sees Pennywise, and which is now gonna lead to his real life nightmare. And the challenge in this sequence is we're basically gonna create a world where he thinks about his past and create a vision of that, which is gonna be a little bit more desaturated in the, in the greens and taking blues out of the skies um, and then coming back into his world. And then we're also gonna go back into another world where he doesn't believe what he's seeing. And so um, I'll go ahead and play that and you can kind of see for yourself. And I'll uh, show you what it's all about. Okay, so we're gonna start off here. And this is this world that he has as a child where he sees that statue. Um, we basically put some saturation into the clothes of the statue because that's what he's really focusing in on. Um, we've changed the grass to like a little bit more yellowish color. And we also took some color out of uh, Richie's face and the color in the sky. So it's, a, it's just a little bit more monochromatic in this world that he's seeing. This sort of like uh, memory that he has of his past that he's reliving right now. So you can see all the blue out of the sky. And again, the, the, the colors that are heightened are the clothes in the statue. Now, when you're doing a really big movie like this, yeah, um, are the director and the cinematographer giving you these um, technical notes as to what they want to see in the color to help tell the story? Or is this what you're adding to this scene and this movie to help tell the story based on what you know they want to get out of the scene story-wise? No, this is totally um, coming from the direction of the director and the cinematographer. 
So these are, um, you know, very, very specific notes that Andy Muschietti has, who's a very visual director. I mean, he loves the DI. He loves playing around. Uh, you know, he's, he really challenges you as a colorist um, to create some of the looks. In fact, w one of the looks that you'll see coming up where, um, you know, Richie sees Pennywise and he kind of doesn't believe he's there was a conceptual idea that Andy had. And he says, hey, let's try to make this into this kind of two-tone world that he's seeing. And I mean, and, and, in, and I'm having to dissolve it from normal into this two-tone world during the shot and come back out and all this stuff. And I mean, it was really challenging. And at first, like, while he was in the Bay, I just said, man, I don't, I can't really think of how I'm gonna do this clean. So let me go home and <laughs> think about this. And I literally came up with, uh, this idea while I was in the shower of all places. So uh, I'll, sh I'll show that to you. So, so here's Richie back in his real world. You see the grass is a little bit bluer. It's a little bit more normal. There's a, the blue sky is back. So mm -hmm. he's back in his kind of normal world. And then big trouble ahead. So he sees that his skin tone gets a little bit yellower. Now, this is this world that Pennywise is in, which is he has this orange-ish hair, red on his face that we have to keep. And these skies that are a little bit green, that's kind of like the overarching theme that we have whenever we're in Pennywise's world in both it, chapter one and chapter two. So this is a lot of chroma key, luma keys to do all of this and keep all this color here. So he's sort of back in reality, as you see, sort of reality, the, the dairy reality. Okay, and then we heighten the color of the balloons, which is a very big story piece, the red balloons, which you'll see there. And then here comes this transition which you'll see in this shot, is transitioning into basically two colors, a cyan and a magenta, and also the challenge of trying in this world to keep this magenta, the cyan, the red, and this orange in his hair all at the same time. So we basically eliminated all of the colors, and it's a sort of like a two-strip look where we just jammed all of the colors in the color palette, including the trees, into this cyan world. But now, instead of just having this orange orangish two strip look we basically had to separate i tried to figure out how to separate the warm colors into this red this orange and this kind of magenta color here and so that's what you'll see in all of these shots so he's did now a lot of a, oh, pardon me sorry go yeah, on go ahead i was going to ask did you use a lot of parallel nodes to keep these worlds crunched together and keeping the orange hair really really bright orange like that yeah, this is a use of uh, two separate splitter combiners. Nice. To do this. Could I ask you one quick question about that? Yeah. And you, you don't need to pop the screen share back up, but right at the end there, it faded back into the normal world before yeah. it cut hard back into the two-tone. Did you use the uh, dynamic keyframe to fade that back into a normal world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a, you, you do have to keyframe that, and it's basically using, um, you know, people are familiar with resolve. I mean, you're basically doing like an opacity, right? Gain between a normal and this affected color. So that's, that's how to do it. Yeah, I'm always blown away with how smooth the uh, dynamic keyframing tools are in resolve. If you, if you give it enough time, if you give it enough patience and you work it enough, you can always get it really, really smooth. And you know, you really can't, it's hard to tell where the shift's actually happening. It's great. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing that stuff. Sure. Um, Elodie, um, can we take a look at uh, some of your clips? Yes, please. Frank Sheeran. Is that right? Yeah, you said right. Uh, under the contract, management can only fire a driver on very specific charges. So, you ever show up late? No. Do you have any moving violations? No. Do you drink on the job? No. Do you ever hit anybody? On a job? Yeah. I don't think so. All right, then. We don't have nothing to worry about. But now I'm a man. 
want you to meet my cousin, Russell Buffalino. How are you? Hi, nice to meet you. It was like the army. You followed orders. You did the right thing. You got rewarded. A friend of ours is having a little trouble. A friend at the top. Back then, there was nobody in this country who didn't know who Jimmy Hoffa was. You got a gun! Get that gun out of his hand! You always charge a guy with a gun. With a knife, you run away. So you charge with a gun, with a knife, you run. Hi, you Frank. Would you like to be a part of history? Yes, I would. Big business and the government are working together, trying to pull us apart. Something's got to be done. What else you say? Now's not the time to not say. I'm a natural lover. We're going at war with these people. I'm a war. Things have gotten out of hand with our friend. You gotta sit down, everybody says so. No, I'm not sitting down, I can't do it! It's what it is. What it is. I know things. They don't know I know. Either way, he's going. You know, I don't, uh, I don't care whether you did it or not. That makes no difference to me. Yeah, I don't. I'm here to defend you, right? Right. What do you want to know? You want to know if I did it or not? No. <laughs> Such a vibrant image, such a vibrant movie. Um, I loved mm -hmm. watching it. It looked, uh, it looked um, so so modern, and it had such this great classic look at the same time. And um, this uh, this isn't a, a color note at all, but um, I'm I'm from Philadelphia originally, and um, the the locations in that movie are so incredibly accurate. And when uh, I was watching it with my parents, and when they saw the Latin Casino used as a location. They mm -hmm. went there all the time and used to see rock bands play. And when they actually saw it portrayed in a, in a real movie, they were like flabbergasted. Wow. It, was, it was so cool. Yeah. Um, but um, in going into the, the Irishman, one of the biggest questions I have for you goes around the realm of um, HDR. And a lot of people ask a lot of questions and say a lot of things about uh, HDR. But the question I have for you in this is normally working in a theatrical space for a, a big Martin Scorsese movie where um, you start theatrical and then move laterally to, um, you know, a, a Dolby Vision or an HDR. Um, but uh, with a movie like The Irishman for Netflix, I guess you could say most people saw the, the HDR version as opposed to seeing it in a theater. So um, when mm -hmm. you were working on The Irishman, was the weight of the grade more on the theatrical or more on the HDR version um, and why? Yeah, yeah, so it was definitely theatrical. We, we timed everything for P3 first. That was our main, main collaborating um, tool. So uh, the reason why I think the Irishman is interesting also nowadays with HDR technology is that the film is supposed to uh, mimic what was filmed, like Kodachrome and Ektachrome. They shot partially film, partially with the red camera. So mixing all those formats to recreate a movie that has film and look was very interesting and then you go to P3 and then knowing that it was also for Netflix and going on HDR, that was the, the, the final pass I would say, but the idea was to still keep the look of the movie. It was not to make a big use of the HDR effect. The movie is not made for that and it's not to be seen for like that. So it was really keeping the film look of the movie, whether it's HDR, Dolby Vision or P3. Absolutely. Um, was it an extra uh, VFX challenge um, grading with all of the, um, the the aging of the actors? Yeah, I know, uh, not at all. And it, they did an amazing job when we were doing the DI. We already worked with the visual effect done. They they worked for a year and a half prior to that. They started from the beginning of the shooting, and we were literally grading with the visual effect done, and they were final already. So for us, it was seamless. It was wonderful. That's awesome. That's great. Um, thank you so much for showing uh, the Irishman trailer. And I believe you have another clip for us from um, Nomadland. Yes, Nomadland, which is the latest, one of the latest movie that I worked on. And uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting, the, 
the similarity between those two movies, even though they're totally different. But when we created the look of the Irishman, uh, walking on the lot, uh, whether it was for Ectachrome or Kodachrome, you, you need to dig into the, uh, the idea of the DP, of what is Ectachrome or Kodachrome, because there's different style and you know, Kodachrome is not just the red. It can be because that's what you want to portray first, but you need to dig into the DP's mind to understand exactly what it means by that. And when we worked on Nomadland, it was a different approach, but the naturalistic idea or look of the movie, my goal was to understand what was the reality of the image for the DP. So, you know, you're in the in DI room and you're like, okay, for you, this is real. This is what it looks like. That's how you saw it because you want a naturalistic look. So it's, it's a lot of a, a, a work with um, a connection with your DP and understanding your DP and, and almost see through his eyes. And, and in different way, one is very filmic, the other one is very naturalistic, totally different, but it's that approach of how do you understand your DP and the more you, the more you work with your DP, the easier it gets. That's awesome. That's great. Um, great, should we, uh, should we play the uh, trailer? Yeah, go for it. It's a teaser, I think it's just the, the first teaser. There's a trailer out, but this is just the teaser. Awesome. Beautiful. Um, I can't wait to see that. And I hear it's coming to theaters in February. Yeah, they. I think they are trying really hard to have it in theater because it was first scheduled for December and they pushed it to February. Uh, but yes, it's one of those movies that you're like, ah, let's see it in theater if we can, please. Of course, of course. Um, uh, I think we're going to start to take some questions from um, uh, our audience members that are viewing right now. And as those questions come in, I have a uh, question um, for both of you. Um, we're going to start with Stefan, but then I also uh, definitely want to hear from Elodie. And the question is, um, as a colorist, when you're getting notes from clients who are not color literate, and I think we've all been in this situation, you get a note like, I, I really want more contrast, but we need to open it up or uh, can we warm up the skin tones, but we really need everything to look bluer. Um, what's the best way to translate to clients who are not color literate? What's the best way to communicate with them? And um, uh, how do you implement that into your client services as a colorist? Well, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, some people are not very uh, color literate as far as their nomenclature goes for us. But that's totally fine. I mean, if someone, you know, an Elodie, I'm sure will tell you the same thing. If, you, if someone even tells us how they feel about things, about a particular shot or scene, like we can already tell what, what they might be thinking. You know, it's, uh, uh, you can take a look at a particular scene or particular shot. And if you have any kind of question about which direction it may go, whether it needs to be brighter, darker, cooler, warmer. And somebody just says, hey, you know, like I'm kind of, I'm kind of wanting the scene to just feel a little bit sadder. I mean, you kind of already know you got to make it a little bit darker or blue or something like this. Even if they may not be able to verbalize it, you can at least try to give them that and say, hey, do you think you might want to try something a little bit darker or a little, maybe a little bit cold or maybe a little bit more desaturated? And then they can give you some feedback on there, right? And at that point, the more they kind of experience, you know, that type of language with you, it's it becomes like second nature, it's very easy. So it doesn't take very long, even with people that are a little bit nervous coming into the, the, the color sessions. Yeah, yeah, I, 
I think the same thing. At that one point, you give them the, the, the language, the words, like as you go, uh, they might just talk about feelings, how they feel about the image, and then you're like, okay, maybe you mean that you want more saturation or a bit warmer. And the fact that you show them what it does to the screen, then the next, next thing you know, they will be like, okay, can you give me two points of red? You know, and they, and oh, they keep saying the, 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 the things the way they do, and, and it's fine, you understand better. And, there's one thing that happens to me quite often. It's like people that just tells you like, can I have more saturation? I want more color. And you're like, maybe what you mean is warmer. And you show them that, oh yeah, actually that's what I mean, you know, or not, but you figure it out. And then, it, and then you have a common language at what at one point. Awesome, um, fantastic answers. Um, uh, the, the first question we are going to take from the audience is, uh, what is your role in pre-production, uh, working with filmmakers? And we are going to start with, uh, with Stefan on that one. Um, sometimes we get really, really involved. Uh, and sometimes we're not involved at all. So uh, it just depends on the projects. I mean, there's some projects that are coming in completely, you know, I, I'm you're requested on a job and, and I come in completely cold. Uh, other times, I'm there to help in uh, pre-production with looks in daily, setting up lookup tables, workflow. Uh, you know, there, it's, it, it just runs a gamut of post-production. I mean, really, it's really a project dependent situation. Yeah, exactly, exactly that. Uh, the two examples actually that I that I showed, the Irishman or Nomadland are two examples of that. For the Irishman, it was two years of my life because we started before even the shooting, we we covered the whole shooting and then we finished the, the DI and an HDR. Nomadland was a, a scenario where the project was shot. They had their own dailies, they edited. I didn't know even about the project. Two weeks prior, I was doing the DI. And they were like, we have a, the movie is here. We need a, a post house and we connected and I watched the movie as it was done and I started working on it just at the end. So you can have, both approach. Personally, I love to be involved from the beginning. I, th I love the creation of the look. I love tweaking the LUT to find something specific for the dailies. I, I just like that. Now, if I don't have it, and, and I also had an amazing time doing Nomadland and being part of the project at the end, it doesn't stop me from doing this for sure. I have a follow-up question, um, Elodie, for you on that one. And um, especially when, when you find yourself in a situation where uh, a project comes in last minute and um, we're, it's like we're doing this, starts on Monday and here, here's a movie. Um, do you find yourself using um, the, the LUT that was used um, you know, for dailies um, do, or do you end up making your own um, LUT for the project um, inspired by that? Or do you like to start from scratch with the director being like the dailies mm -hmm. are nice, but let's, let's make our own look. Um, what's what's normally your strategy of how you like to go about that when you're in that situation, of course? Yeah, it's an excellent question. First, I need to know if they're happy with their dailies or not. If they're happy with their dailies, I will consider that. I can't just erase everything and be like, oh, I'm going to do my own thing because I think it's better. Or I, I need to start with that. And then it's a conversation before we start the direct. For Nomadland, it's interesting because um, I knew they were happy with their dailies. They just had the lot on it. It was just a, a lot. Uh, applied uh, so but they were happy with that and when we started before we started the DI we had a one session just to play with the image certain sequences just to have a, a feeling of the image and for me and Josh to meet Josh the DP uh, and I like to show them different things so I showed him different LUTs and what we can do with it and it turns out at the end of the session, we are like, no, we keep the, the lot that we, we used on the, day, the, the dailies, which is his lot that he created and he loved it. And he was like, open to see other things, but it didn't work out for that project. And so we, we kept his lot. Nice. I guess at the end of the day, like all of us, um, it's whatever the, the client wants. And if they're happy with it, we go with it. If they're not happy, we step in and we give them what they want and need, right? Yeah, and, and you need to also, you just need to make sure at the end that okay, this, for example, is not broken, there's nothing wrong with it. And then it's like, okay, if that's the look you wanna go for, and I think I can have that look with your lot, I'm, I'm happy to use it. I don't, have, I don't have to use the lot that I prefer, which might be totally different from the look that you want. So it might actually be, will be more trouble for me to use it. So 
you know, as long as everything is technically correct, you can start with anything. Absolutely. Um, Stefan, we have a question for you. And the question is, um, where do you go for continual inspiration? Um, I don't know, I just, I think just the other colorists around me here, <laughs> you know, in uh, company three at all of our competitors, everyone. I mean, you know, you, you look at people's images, you look at the shows, you watch movies, you can find inspiration anywhere. I mean, you know, everyone's does amazing work. And sometimes, you know, I'll watch something and it looks really fantastic. And I will, I'll wait for the credits to end so I can see who colored it, mm -hmm. you know? And then maybe we have a conversation about it. And sometimes, um, you know, when we as colorists, we share what we've done, some of the uh, difficult jobs we've been on, and we can kind of see through them how much work they had to put in to get the images to look the way they do. And he's just like, well, how did you do that? And then, you know, we share tips. And uh, yeah, you, 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 know, you add a couple tricks into your wheelhouse of color correction. And I mean, it just starts expanding like crazy. So um, yeah, I mean, that's where I, I find just some inspiration just viewing things, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. When, when, you take, when you take a good Instagram feed and when you start following a bunch of post houses and a bunch of great colorists and the rec recommendations just keep coming and you follow the comments and you follow the hashtags and you get a good curated feed going, you could just have an endless scroll of just the most beautiful images and videos and trailers and reels. And, you know, um, it's endless. And I think colorists on Instagram is one of the best parts of uh, the community at large. And I was saying to both of you earlier that the colorist community is such a great community because um, colorists are such sharing and kind and, um, uh, you know, uh, communicative people. Um, if that's the right way to say that word, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and continuing on that question, um, what shows and movies are you guys watching right now? Just, not just to, to fill the time, but what shows and movies are really blowing your mind right now when it comes to color grading and cinematography? What, what are you watching that's making you go like, wow, like this is really, you know, um, this is inspiring. This is dictating a trend. This is, you know, this is, uh, this, this is a, a leading show. Uh, so lately I watched uh, The Crown that I, it, I, it's beautifully shot. The set design is wonderful. Um, the actors, like I was really impressed about it and I only watched season four. I didn't even start from the beginning, but I watched it, I was like, oh wow, it's quite impressive. And as a movie, I saw The Nest. Uh, it was released like a couple of weeks ago. It's beautiful. The, the DP is the um, DP of Son of Soul which I forgot his name, I'm terrible with name, but uh, the, I just love the ambience of the movie, the rhythm of it, it's kind of slow, there's really slow movement camera, I just, it, and it, it, it looks beautiful, I love it. Uh, what about you, Stefan? Um, I haven't watched anything for a while because I've been working so long and so many hours correcting <laughs> A few movies and a few TV shows. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my own images at this point, day and night. So <laughs> one, of these, one of these days I'll, I'll, I'll get to go watch TV, some TV shows again. That's, that's a pretty good reason not to watch stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He's the uh, busiest guy around. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that's great. And, and going on that, there, is a, there are a lot of people that want to be that busy or want to grow to be that busy. And there's a really good question here. Um, and there, there's a, a bunch of questions that are coming in in the same vein. And I've, I've asked you some of these questions before and I like the way some of these are being phrased. Um, a lot of people are asking something along the lines of, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you get started to be a colorist? Um, how do you get your first job as a colorist? So um, let's, let's phrase it this way. For all of the people out there who are like, you know, I wanna do this for a living. Um, What's the best way to get started, in, in your opinion? Let's start with Elodie. Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. I don't think there's one way to make it, especially nowadays, because there's, very, there's different doors. Like you can enter from visual effect background, from painting, from movie as a, like a DP. 
it's 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 very wide. Uh, in in my personal story, I started by I I wanted to be an editor, and I ended up working in a lab in France where they were doing color timing in in at the lab, and it was the beginning of the DI as well. So it was not totally full on like digital. Uh, and I started like that as a color assist, then editor also for DI, and and I follow the the colorist Ivan Lucas, who's my mentor, and then he, he brought me with him, and I spent hours and hours watching him working, and and you can feel like oh I'm not doing anything, you're in the room, you're there, you're watching, but those hours of watching what he does is are so fascinating when you take ten years of your life and concentrate that, that makes me who I am now and how I work. It's because of how he trained me and how much I work, I watched him working. So th again, there's no right or wrong. Just watch movie, be curious, go. Now I see, like I look at nature all the time with, with an eye of, of a colorist. I'm like, oh wow, this color is kind of crazy, but that's nature, you know? Or you go to museum and you're like, this painting is insane. The contrast is wonderful. Why before, I was watching it like anyone else, but uh, you look at details nowadays that you you can get information everywhere on internet as well. Like just look at details, it's interesting. And then software, you can learn them, it's technical. So once you have the sensibility of those details, then you learn the system as well. And you're like, okay, that's how I do this. It's technical that you can you can learn. Wonderful. A lot of angles indeed, um, that's for sure. Especially, especially now, um, there's, a, there's software that is, that is free that you can download mm -hmm. that some, some folks know about. Um, Stefan, um, what would you say? To, how, would, how, would, how would you advise folks to get started um, in, in this business today? Well, okay, this is a, a couple step process. Uh, yeah. So in life, you know, before you get great, you need to be good. And before you get good, you need to be bad. And before you're bad, you got to try, right? So the first thing to do is if you're interested in it, you got to try to start color correcting somewhere where, like you said, whether you get free software, where you start playing around, um, you know, uh, online, uh, you know, any which way you can, whether you take courses, see if that interests you and see if, um, you know, you may have an aptitude for it. So it's kind of like when you watch small kids in a class, right? Everyone has different uh, skill sets. Um, somebody could walk out of bed and be more athletic than another person, or somebody could draw better than someone else. So I think when you try to pursue a career, um, you basically want to find something where when you just hop out of bed, this is something that's very natural for you. Right, like to be really good at something, you, it's gotta come really natural for you. So kind of like the way Ellie was saying, she tried editing and she was at editing house. So when I got out of film school, I mean, I was in production, kind of did, it wasn't for me. I was doing it for like two years and it kind of just wasn't me. And then I tried editing at a post. I said, well, maybe let's, you know, I, I kind of feel comfortable going somewhere every day and not traveling all over the world. That wasn't for me. So I said, well, let me go to the post house. And I tried editing and I, and I remember working with some editors and I'm like, I am just never gonna be as good as these people. Like, I don't have the patience to sit through 27 takes and try to figure out which take is the best one, you know? So I just knew no matter how much I tried and no matter how much I tried to put to that craft, like I was never gonna be as good as some of the editors that I saw in LA. So it's kind of like, well, I need to try something else. And then, I was at a post house, another post house, and I, uh, there were colorists there. And, um, you know, I tried coloring and it's something like, it was just very easy for me, right? So it's something I can sit in a dark room, pitch black, not see sunlight all day, all, all night. My eyes don't get tired. Um, I'm completely involved. And, you know, like it just, it, I found something that I'm really good at. So, you know, other things may have interested me but I found out early on, I'm not good at it. So then I just tried something else. And tried, so I would say if people wanna be a colorist, just try it, you know? Um, try coloring again, try taking some courses, maybe you can do things, load things on your computer, you can do things for free. 
Um, you can get to a post house and start off in the vault or receptions or something. You can see if that's even the lifestyle that you want, you know, because it's a very specific lifestyle to have as a colorist. Um, see if you have an aptitude for it. And then if you do, you pursue it. And if you don't, try something else. It's, it's totally okay, right? But at, this, you know, at the end of the day, it's like your passion, like everybody says it's your passion. Well, you, I mean, your passion is for you, right? And your purpose is for other people. So if you have a passion for something and you're really good at it, and then you can give service to other people like coloring for directors and cinematographers, now you have your purpose in life, right? So that's what everybody just has to discover for themselves. But the first step is just try and, you know, start off your life, start, start going. I really love that answer. That was really great. You have to try to be bad and be bad to be good and be good to be great. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Um, that's awesome. Um, here's, a, here's a pretty good question because um, we see, we see really, really fantastic image, images all the time. And then sometimes we see images that, um, you know, even really phenomenal, you know, cinematographers that normally give us really great images. Sometimes people will come into my room and go, you know, I just, I had the wrong ISO. We just didn't get it. Sometimes something went wrong. What can we do about this? Um, so, and you know, we have to sometimes take a crowbar to the panels. I've heard folks say that before to try to pull the best images out of what we have come into our rooms. So this question is, what would you recommend independent filmmakers with smaller budgets do to capture the best images possible in production to prevent more hours and hours of color correction and post? And I don't think this person means in the, in the context of to, to prevent the need for color correction. I think they, they mean for the context of need more color correction than normally necessary. Uh, um, Elodie, I, what do you think? Yeah, I can start. Uh, this is this is the, the DP job, I would say, <laughs> you know, it's like it can happen. Yes, you have to to fix certain thing, but it's 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 a combination between uh, the money that I have on production, the DP and the camera they use and um, Honestly, also, there, there's one thing I think that is important, whether you're a small budget or a bigger budget, contact your post house before you start, because you will have a lot of answer with that. And you don't have to pay, it's fine, we can help out. But contacting your post house to know what's gonna happen at the end prevents from doing mistake at the beginning. And that helps any colorist in the end. You know, I'd rather someone that has questions six months prior to the DI, just to make sure it's fine. Then, then not asking, thinking, oh, we'll see that in post, and then it's a, <laughs> it's a shit show. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Stefan, do you have any thoughts on on that? I agree 100%. I mean, <laughs> it really starts with your cinematographer, and you, you know, all the important parts about a production, from costume design to production design. I mean, you know, the amount of problems and trouble that we have like you know you you have somebody that has the same color clothing as their skin and then they're up against a wall with the same color and then they want color separation i mean it's like a total nightmare right so you know when you hire people on a production that has as the sensibilities and they've gone through these kind of things and say oh my god i put this person in like a yellow sweater and there was a yellow wall and it was a total nightmare then they know not to do something like that. But if you don't, and you don't hire experienced people sometimes, or you know, you, you don't have the money, I mean, you, you can get yourself into some really problematic situations. And there's no matter what, you know, no matter what we do, we can't make something that's not looking great look great. We can only make it kind of look sort of decent or use some other kind of crazy method, but it's never gonna look like it was shot really, really well. So, um, you know, like, I, I, again, same, same thing. My answer would be the same, but you just really got to hire some good cinematographers and make sure like your production team is really, really good. Agreed entirely. Um, here we go. So going back a little bit to HDR, um, until about, just about now, um, the monitors and the workflows in order to handle a proper HDR workflow have been very, very expensive. Um, ergo, you know, most of the folks that have been working in HBR, HDR, pardon me, have been, um, you know, people working at the top uh, post houses uh, like you folks. 
Um, in 2021, it'll probably be the first year where a lot of colorists who aren't in the major post houses will be working in HDR for the first time with the advent of these mid-level monitors that, you know, at, at the end of the day, comparing apples to oranges, they're, you know, probably not a, a Sony 310 or, or a Flanders scientific of, of, of that caliber. But um, for colorists that are going to be working in HDR for the first time in 2021 with these uh, mid-range monitors, what advice do you have for colorists working in HDR for the first time since you, you folks have been working in the format uh, for a, more than a few years now? Oh, we'll go to Stefan first. Pardon me. Sorry, guys. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. You know, I, get, I, I mean, the, the, the main thing is that you have a calibrated monitor as a colorist, right? Whatever money you choose to use professional, I mean, hopefully, um, you have to have a good calibrated monitor. And if you're not calibrated, everything you're doing kind of, if, you, if you're doing some really fine color correction, tweaking really small things, but your monitor isn't calibrated right, I mean, you're kind of just doing things blind, right? So make sure that whether you have probes or you, you, know, you personally own probes that you can calibrate your monitor property, properly. Um, you know, in professional facilities, I mean, we basically all use OLEDs also. So that's another good hint um, because of the contrast and the color representation. So, um, you know, make sure you have a good uh, color calibrated monitor. And then if you're working in HDR, make sure your mind is open to HDR and your ideas of Rec. 709 um, kind of disappear for a while and kind of just let your mind flow with HDR because it's a larger color space um, it, with more dynamic range. So, you know, it's kind of like you just have to kind of open your mind to what can be accomplished in that space. And um, once you do that, you're, you'll be in pretty good shape. Yeah, I think there's a there's something that's going to be interesting for me, at least uh, when HDR really become the norm, is that as of right now, we are doing P3, Red 709, and we have an HDR version. And, and when we do that, we arrive in HDR and be like, oh my god, then I see this, and then I see that, or I can tweak the blacks here, and I have more information, and you see the difference with your Red 709 or your P3 screen. Uh, when HDR will be your first and only pass, which it happens at times already, but that's your starting point. And you almost get so used to it right away that you're already, like to me, you're already working with the whole capacity of the HDR and, and, and you're making the image already like used with the whole HDR concept of like seeing all those details and that higher range, uh, which I think for new colorists working on HDR will be, um, how can I say that? It's like, it's like it, will, it will become the standard. So we'll not, at least we'll get so used to it that we will not even realize that we are doing HDR and it's so much better than the Rec. 709. And it's like, okay, that's the norm and that's my beautiful image, you know? So, but it's good to keep in mind that yes, the high dynamic range is so rich and you, you have so much to tweak. And to that extent, it's good that the system that we're using as well, whether it's base light or resolve, they are, they are updating their tool with that. And we are going to tweak more and more certain part of the image because of HDR, because of the capacity of HDR, and we have so much more range to play with, which is, makes, makes it very interesting. And um, to, to follow up on that, right now we're kind of living in a, in a 1000 nits world when it, comes to, um, when it comes to television. And um, hypothetically, we could go up to 10,000 based on um, the, uh, what Dolby thinks is, is possible. And Flanders has their 3000 nit monitor. Um, how high do you see NIT levels going for consumer sets? And have, have you graded on a 3000 NIT monitor? And how high do you see um, consumer uh, grading, or that's not the right way to phrase the question, pardon me. Um, how bright in terms of NITs do you think we'll get before the brakes are pumped and everyone generally goes, okay, that's it. That's as bright as we're gonna get for HDR and that's gonna be the format for a, for a long time now. Um, because a lot of folks think that we're not finished at 1,000 nits. Um, Stefan, mm -hmm. what do you think? Well, uh, you know, 1,000 nits is pretty bright. Um, in a dark room, it's pretty bright. 
So if you go outside 12 o'clock in the afternoon on a bright sunny day and you can do a light measurement on a chrome bumper, you can get 8,000, 9,000 nits. So that's kind of like not a reality in someone's home. Um, that kind of brightness in someone's home is gonna be extremely, extremely bright. So, you know, when you're crafting images, I think when you have explosions and things like that, like a thousand nits, I mean, they, they look okay. But in general, uh, even when we're doing HDR, I mean, when you see light bulbs and sconces and skies or anything that's like super bright, like a th even at a thousand, I mean, you really notice it. Like you may not be noticing it in, a, in, in the P3 version or Rec 709, but you really notice it there. So in a way, uh, let's put it this way. This is just more of like a creative choice, okay? If you were to take, I don't know, like a, 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 a very realistic looking images, 12 o'clock in the afternoon, mm -hmm. and you've got bright sunlight, you've got bright lights hitting a car, and you've got the sun in the background, right? It's a pretty bright looking picture. So if you had a realistic image of that, that looks correct, right? Now, if you, do, if you were to paint that on canvas where the brightest thing on, a, on, on canvas is the white of that canvas, right? That's the brightest white that could be. So the sky and the chrome on the bumper and all of that can only be a certain level of brightness, but you would paint the pictures of people's faces you know, with a with short, sort of like less of a ratio than what you'd be seeing, right? So the faces would go here and the brightest part would go here. Well, when you get to 10,000 nits, you're like, your bright's here and your faces are way down there, right? So you're, you're, you're seeing more of the bright, the bright objects are becoming more prevalent in the images, which may not be pleasing for anyone um, in that type of format. So uh, it remains to be seen where it's gonna go. But uh, I can tell you early on when we were pushing this technology to where we're doing like 1500 plus nits and I'm color correcting a really, really bright movie. I mean, I, I had like eye strain at the end of the day, eight hours of doing that. You know, like it's not like you're seeing spots, but I mean, there was some definite eye strain going along. And so, you know, I've always said, I mean, it's going to go where it's going to go. I don't know how healthy keep going brighter and brighter and brighter images in dark rooms are going to be healthy for your eyes. It's not quite sure. You know, someone would have to do a study on that. But um, I would say almost 100% of the jobs, unless it's specifically required. I mean, I think all colorists are suppressing the highlights on stuff at a thousand. You know, like most of the time we're not even, we're not hitting like a thousand on, you know, light bulbs and sconces and, you know, things like that, that are, that are just kind of like naturally bright in, in everyday life. So we'll see what happens. That's very interesting. Um, Elodie, are, are you usually hitting a thousand nits? Are you using the whole range? Or are you usually not going anywhere near that, that top point? And where do you normally set your highlights when you're working in a thousand nit range? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not eating the thousand uh, because first of all, what we are doing is, is helping the story to be told. And, and if what you're looking at is the bulb of the lights, unless it's really what you want the audience to look at, there's no point for you to be, to be that bright on, on, on that. You need to keep a, a certain ratio of contrast in your image that makes sense for the story that is happening. So even if you have the capacity of going that high, I, I just don't. Uh, still, you can still have the, the HDR effect. And to me, what is, 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 is good with this technology, it's the detail that you get more than the, because you don't need to go to a thousand, it, like it, it, it burns your eyes, basically. What's the point to be brighter? What's interesting is to have more detail in the skies, to have more details in the shadows. That's what interests me. So yes, compared to a Rec 709, I will not see detail in the sky. I will not see the clouds the same way, and I will not reach the sun the same way. With the HDR, I can. Now, it doesn't mean that the highest point needs to be at 1,000 nits, and most of the time, I'm reducing that 20%. All right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, for the next question, um, I think this is a, a fun one, and we'll start with Stefan. 
um, uh, because you've created so many I iconic, huge Hollywood movies. Um, I guess what movie out, out of all of them stands out the most to you and why? Too hard of a question. Yeah, too hard of, <laughs> of course, right? They're all different. I mean, they're all different in, in so many ways. It's just, that's a different question. But um, I mean, there are dozens of them that like are memorable in different ways. So could I rephrase that one for you? Uh -huh. if, if, you, if you can think of a filmmaker you haven't worked with yet, who, who would you want to work with uh, and why? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I've worked with a lot of the filmmakers that I wanted to work with. Um, I think, you know, when a filmmaker wants to work with you, then there's just, there's just like a natural uh, uh, creative element that's really good, right? Like, you know, it's kind of like if you're dating, you know, if you want to ask somebody out and they want to date you back, then it's great. It's a great relationship, <laughs> right? But if I want to work with somebody, but somebody maybe doesn't want to work with me, that's totally fine. So I, I don't really have like, this like burning desire to go work with any particular person. I just focus in on the people that I work with and that like working with me. All right. Um, Elodie, is there a, a, any uh, a filmmaker or uh, a couple of filmmakers that you um, hope to, to work with um, in the future that, that uh, you love or that inspire you? Yeah, so well, I mean, yes, there's there's a few people that that I I watch their work and I'm like, oh my god, this is this is great, this is amazing, and and I love that. Now, um, I, I'm not gonna name anyone specifically, but it's just I like the idea of you know you you meet people and you have a, a human connection as well, or maybe it's the project also that brings you together, and it's like you love the movie or the director, and then you end up working with this DP, and and so. Yeah, again, there's there's a lot of people that are talented. Definitely a lot. I see things like this year. I've seen a million things, and I many times I was like, oh, I need to contact that person just to say that like, I love your work. You know, not not even to for anything else, but it's just because it's like, oh wow, beautifully shot. Like, how did you do that? Same with colorists. I contact colorists as well sometimes. Like, wow, amazing, great job there. And and I like this um, sense of uh, family in a way of like. You know, you you support each other, and you you you're okay. If they want to work with you, great. If they don't, it's fine. You know, it's it's just a a, a nice environment just to f see the work that is done and to recognize the work that is done. It doesn't mean that I absolutely want to work with them. They do a great job already. They don't need me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I um definitely go for your sense of a uh, uh, community and family in terms of you know all of us uh, supporting one another. That's uh that's great. <laughs> Um, here's a, here's a really good one. Um, uh, how do you work with your, with your assistants and color assists? How do you share the tasks? Could each of you kind of break down the roles of how you work with, um, your color assists when you're working on, um, different, uh, kinds of movies and, um, Stefan, uh, we can start with you. Um, I really depends on the experience of the assist. Uh, um, you know, if I'm working with a newer assist, then, uh, you know, it's just basically, we train all of our assists to be smarter than the colorist as far as the uh, the technicalities of the facility. So they've got to know the box sort of resolve better than we do. Um, so that's the first step. And um, once they can nail that down and they become really good assists, um, then we can help. Uh, they can help us start pre grading, and. Um, you know, we'll help them on that because everybody, when they start pre-grading, you know, you kind of give them a lot of tips and pointers about what they did wrong. Like we all did too. I mean, we all had, you know, like Elodie was saying, she had Yvonne and I had several colorists, like all colorists at some point has a mentor, senior colorist that helps shape their color and how they approach things and how they approach clients. And so um, it just depends. I mean, one of my assistants for years is a, is a, colorist now a technicolor and he's great and he was fantastic and he he did a tremendous amount of work uh with me on projects i mean we were we we're a total team together you know so he would do 3d he would do all the 3d i'm color correcting he would do you know all the technical work on the 3d he'd help me out with the uh, uh the rec 709 passes marketing everything i mean so it could you know you as a assist the more trust the colorist has in you, the more they allow you to do. 
and then at some point you'll just be so good to you, you, know, you just kind of like go on your own and you'll be uh, you'll be fine great awesome um how about you Elodie how do you how do you work with uh your color assists what what roles do you help designate and, and what's what's your relationship like with uh assists so yeah, I've been an assist for so many years that now if I can let the assist do all the technical parts, I'm super happy. Like I, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to think about it. And I love that I have a great assist that if we start a session, he, he think about everything before. I don't even need to ask him like, do you think this is ready or blah, blah, blah. And I, I love not having to worry about that and trust him because he's good. So otherwise he can really just have like be a nightmare quickly if, if it's not totally ready. So so all the technical parts, I, I let them do that as much as I can. Now I still like to check, you know, it's, it's a trust issue here, but uh, it's good to to have someone that has your back. Uh, and in terms of color, that, uh, that's another thing, depends on the project. If I have the time, I like to start my, uh, my own color and do my own um, first pass, I would say, because I need and I, I want to fill the image when I start color grading. So I like to do that. If I have, if I don't have enough time for it, or if I'm doing another thing at the same time, yes, I can I can give it to you for pre timing and, and and I'll check after. Or you can you can help out, you know, like train them as you have a scene and you give them direction. Like if I were a DP and like okay, you have some time here, do this sequence for me, and this is the direction it needs to go to, and then you check after and you help them. But I, yeah, color wise, I have to say I like to do my own thing. I like to start from zero. That's great. That's awesome. Um, I, I guess also, it, it, I guess it wouldn't be a, a, a 2020 panel if, if we didn't have a couple questions concerning how uh, COVID has changed post-production our industry. Um, in, in March, it was kind of uh, wild how everyone packed up everything and found a way to um, uh, work from home. And then I guess based on the based on the company and the facilities, some some folks slowly went back into the office a little bit. Some folks stayed home. I've still been working from home since um since March. Um, what what have you guys um, been doing since uh, since the pandemic started? And then also, what more, more importantly, actually, I think this is the more important question: What has uh, COVID changed in terms of remote post production? that is probably going to stay very relevant and very popular even after we go back to whatever uh, whatever a new normal looks like in terms of remote grading, remote viewing, um, uh, remote sharing with clients. Um, what's going to return to what we had in 2019 and what's going to stay the way it is now? Uh, what do you think about that, Stefan? Um, well, first of all, as far as how COVID has affected me, um, I have been working for, I mean, at back of the office probably since summer, like early, like nonstop, basically. Um, I've had several movies that were, um, you know, they kept going all the way through to finish for release next year. One of them released, uh, is going to get released in November, News of the World. So, um, uh, but several others are getting released next year that we, you know, it's kind of in the can now. Um, some of the TV shows kept going that they were already shot before COVID hit everyone and everything got shut down. So I had several, several projects. Um, so it's been kind of business as usual for me. So I've come back in the office. I have to work in a theater um, because of the feature situation. And because I'm here, I can just jump into a, one of our, um, you know, our, our other bays that just has a monitor, an X300 monitor. So I can do the TV shows there or marketing or whatever. So I just kind of jump around from bay to bay. Um, and, um, uh, what was your other, your other question? Um, what do you think is going to stay the same in terms of how we uh, interact with, um, clients? Cause you know, yep. normally there's so much client services than being in the room with us. What's going to go back to normal. What's going to, uh, stay the way we're doing it now. Yep. So we've been doing remote sessions with our clients, um, through an iPad, a calibrated iPad. Um, so they've been signing off. And we can have multiple people on with different iPads. Um, and we kind of just basically get on a call like this and everybody's on their iPad and I'm looking at my X300 and we can have three, four, five people looking at things at the same time and they've signed off. So I've done, I don't know, like two, two or three features. I haven't seen a single person 
live. <laughs> <laughs> so, and actually it hasn't been on Zoom because I'm in a dark room, so they can't see me anyway. So they've only been, we've only been talking to each other over a phone, you know, over a conference call. So I've finished a few movies, pretty large size movies that where I have not seen a single face this whole time. Wow. So that, we don't know if that's going to stay, but I mean, certainly with the traffic in LA that has gotten worse <laughs> as the years have gone by, I mean, you can really see how somebody could just say, hey, look, I've got this, you know, you got one scene, I've got the iPad, let me just go see the scene on the iPad instead of driving, you know, 45 minutes across town to be with you for 10 minutes and then drive 45 minutes back. That's not going to go away. For sure, that's not going to go away. So a lot of those kind of things, I'm sure will stay. So a lot of short form stuff, like, I mean, you know, why would somebody just drive back and forth for like two hours when they're literally going to be here for like 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Like, that makes no sense. They can just be, they can be at their office or something and they can look at it on, on, on their iPad. I mean, it's probably 95% color accurate with depending on what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's great. And that this pandemic has basically forced the technology where we've had to adopt and had to invent and have to sort of reinvent ourselves. And that's been fantastic, honestly. I mean, it's, it's, we were going to have to do that eventually anyway, but now, I mean, you know, it's already here. Maybe it would have been done next year, maybe the year after that, but now it's, it's like really here. And so, you know, I would say probably nine out of 10 sessions that I have are done remotely that way. So it's been fantastic. That's wild. I think in, in every post-production company, really every technology company, anyone that had hundreds or thousands of people that, that just went home, the, the debt of gratitude that we owe all of our engineers and all of the people that were able to just have us boom, within a couple of days, a couple of weeks, they set this up. And then as, as the holes happened, they just filled them in and they just made it work. And um, at, at, at my company, at least, witnessing all the engineers doing all their work and making it all happen to still have it being so smooth um, is just a feat in and of itself. And it's still every day just um, amazes me to see how much we can get done every day back and forth between um, edit and sound and color going back and forth. It's just uh, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, Elodie, how's, how's it been at, um, at Harbor, uh, um, you know, with uh, remote workflows and things like that? Yeah, same thing here. Like uh, in in few days, weeks, I was able to work from home if needed. Uh, the only difference, uh, obviously, is that I don't have a P3 screen here. So if I need to do something in P3, I have to be at the office. And I think since the beginning of the, the whole pandemic, I share my time. It's 50-50. I work from home as much as I had to go to the office. Uh, uh, I, and I love working from home. I'll be honest with you. Having session with a, on Zoom or Teams with clients, Clients are super happy. It, it, it's calibrated iPad the same way. They, we can schedule the session. It, it's way more easier for them to be present when they have to, and then they, they go on to doing their days, and then they come back in. So I think the flexibility of working from home without having to, again, commute, go to the office is, is so much better. And, and it works perfectly, like the system that I have here. It's, it's, yeah, I'm connected to the system at Harbor, and I see the same thing that if I were at Harbor, so, so for me, I would love to keep that hybrid situation where, you know, I can do my whole day at Harbor on P3 and then I go home, it's Saturday and Saturday I'm like, you know what, I have time. I'm gonna adjust certain windows and do things. Oh, I sleep, I wake up, I'm like, oh my God, I got an idea. I need to do that right now. I, I sometimes I have that rush. I was like, oh, I, I need to try that. But if I have to drive 45 minutes, maybe I'll wait on for Monday, you know? <laughs> so, or it can happen at 10 p.m., you know, those things. So having the, the, the possibility to work from home to me was, was a good thing. And the clients appreciate, I think. It was, it worked well. I, they have the same expectation, no matter what, but we deliver the same quantity and quality. So, so I think for that, it's, it's been good the way the engineer handled it. Imagine science, because that's a big part of it. You need to trust your team to make sure everything is fine because yes, when they talk about a quarter or point of color or certain contrast, you need to make sure that everyone sees the same thing. So, but yeah, no, it's been, it's been good. Then can get lonely. That's another thing. At times you're like, okay, it's not the same thing when I have my clients in the room. At times you're like, okay, I'm missing you. I wish I could see you. It would make, make it more fun, but 
it's it's not so bad. And if the client yeah. is in New York, you know, there's no, there's no such thing now as like, oh, my client is in New York. I need to go to New York. Okay. Now we all know in two seconds it can happen. We we could eventually before we were able to in a way, but now it's like, yeah, it's not even a question anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I do miss the little knocks on the door and the little in, impromptu, you know, um, uh, questions and conversations and things you learn and things you pick yeah. up from the little... Um, oh, I learned this trick, or here's this other thing mm -hmm. to know about this um, that you're missing a little bit. But I guess we're just going to have to find new ways to work around those two now. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, the 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 last big question I have for you for you, for you guys is about uh, trends, um, because the the movies that you work on have such a large influence on all of the work that happens around you around the world. So. When you're working on a big movie, and I mean, I, this has a lot to do with the, the cinematography that you're receiving also, but when you're working on a movie and creating a big movie, making a big look, um, do you realize that you're, when you're doing something new and you're making something new, that you're influencing a trend or creating or dictating a new trend um, or right, right in the middle of a really popular look that seems to be... Um, popular with a, a large group of movies in the same genre. Um, what, how do you guys feel about the way color or trends influence color correction and color grading in movies? And um, are you aware of them while you're working? Uh, let's start with Stefan. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it does to a certain extent. Uh, but, you know, as a colorist, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know, most of us feel the same way. I mean, it's, it's, it's really all about the feel. And when you talk to cinematographers, it's the same thing. You know, like I really don't remember the technicalities of what I've done on one movie versus the next one because they're all kind of different. So even the things that I did on it chapter two, like I had to really go back and <laughs> kind of read about like what I said. <laughs> on other articles about that, because I mean, I really don't remember like what I did then. Oh yeah, okay, I remember how I did that now. But I mean, I have no idea at a certain extent, right? <laughs> like you have you, you have your whole tool set and then as you're going through each shot, you're just instinctively going, you know, I think I need to pull a chroma key here. I think I need to soften skin here. I think I need to do some vignettes here. I think I need, you know, and, and no one should be able to see that, but you know while you're doing it that you're doing it. So it's just kind of this instinctive process that you have while you're going through each of the individual images on a particular movie. Um, and yeah, certainly I think if we, you know, whether we're watching TV shows or movies or magazines or whatever, if there's a certain trend, I mean, that, that could affect us. Um, but if that's not appropriate for the movie, we don't use it, right? So slowly you start incorporating some things and, and, some, and a lot of times the clients will drive that too. So the clients may drive that type of look and then it'll work for that one movie. And then all of a sudden that's in your brain for in your wheelhouse of like using it in another movie that's very similar to that. So, you know, it's between our sensibilities and also our client sensibilities together. That's kind of in your brain to, to um, start creating and reshaping images. Yeah, right. totally. I totally agree with that. At one point, do do we realize? No. Also, it's a it's a teamwork. It's it's the vision of the director and the DP to tell a story, and they come also with their own idea to start with. That is the beginning of the look that you're gonna create. But um, certainly, what we see the day before, me the day before the year prior, me and freelancers, you know, certain TV shows, they were like, oh, I really like that. I feel like maybe I can go this way or this way, but. But you know, it, it's all about yeah the feeling, the feeling, the story. Also, like I've worked on project this year that are totally the opposite, but completely the opposite right? in terms of stories, in terms of look, and so you don't use even the same tool. Now for both, I still have this thing about oh for that kind of look, I use that tool. Hmm, I'm gonna remember that that I've never used before, not as much, and I found that very interesting for that kind of look or for. This one, I used those tools that were very helpful to create the look that I was looking for, and and maybe we'll work for another one. You know, so those are like technical tips that you can keep from one movie to another. But but in terms of, of look itself, it's it's a it's a collaboration process, and uh, 
and, and and everyone has his own influence from rather their life, what they've done the weekend before, what they had in mind, what they saw, and 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 you put that all together, and that's how I think you you kind of mix it all and create a look all together. Awesome, awesome. Um, I want to thank both of you so much for your time and for speaking with us tonight. You're both such thank you. wonderful, oh, talented, wow. celebrated artists. Um, and it's very kind that you were able to spend so much time uh, speaking tonight. Um, thank you again. Um, happy holidays. Thank you very much. And yeah, th thanks again. This, this was so much fun. Thanks, thank Jason. Thanks. I think I'll come back. That must be my cue, Jason, to yes. come back on and uh, and say thanks to you. Seriously, this was I. I feel like I just dropped into it. four years of a of a an upper level master's course in color correction. Um, so thank you for. I mean, that was that was a lot. <laughs> you guys must be tired. Um, but it's great fun to learn about uh, about the, your craft and <clears throat> the ideas behind it some of the tech behind it. Um, I, I'm gonna have to find out what a thousand nits means. Um, <laughs> you're obviously not referring to like a lice outbreak. So <laughs> let's excuse my ignorance. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank I'll quickly uh, sign off by saying that Manhattan Edit Workshop and Sight Sound of Story don't have another event coming up next month. This is the first time we haven't said, stay tuned for our next event. So we'll, we're gonna come up with a lot more ideas for 2021. But I think what we're going to do is we're going to take a break. We're going to shovel some snow. We're going to hang out with our families. We're going to relax and watch some some great movies. Uh, I will mention just on a side note, I watched First Cow uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was like, I can't believe they shot 16 millimeter four by three. This thing looks like someone ran over it with a car. This is a western by uh, Kelly Riker, and I started reading an article about the cinematography, and someone said like what stock did you use to get that was great did you shoot, shoot on 16 and the guy laughed he was like we shot it on an alexa mini and we went to such great lengths to make it look like it was shot on 16 um and you never you just the, we're sort of at the reverse now where you know you can it, can, it was an imperceptible and incredibly powerful look for the film which is a, it was a period piece set in the i guess the late 1800s um and it was just an it was a magically appropriate look for the film. And you thought that they went to such great lengths and had this ideology, we're gonna shoot it on 16, we're gonna, you know, and no, they shot digital and they just had the tools available to them to yeah. create what they wanted to create. It was, uh, it was kind of amazing. Um, but anyway, that was just an aside. I'll let everybody go. I know it's getting late. Uh, thanks again so much for showing up. And I wanna thank our sponsors again. This is OWC, Shutterstock, Zeiss, American Cinema Editors, and all the people like you out there um, who come and watch these events and make it worthwhile. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all the questions. We got to a ton of them though. So I don't feel so bad about uh, the amount of questions we covered. We really did cover a lot. So thanks. We will see you in 2021 and um, have a great rest of the year, everybody. We're gonna sign off. I got into sound designing at a point when things were just developing. I was really fascinated by the idea that dialogue effects, music were all components of the soundtrack to a film, which had never occurred to me before. My friends and I would make little videos um, in our backyards, you know, imitations of Indiana Jones and Star Wars. And, you know, eventually that need to tell stories became more of a technical interest and an interest in the, the art. I think what attracted me to color correction was the fact that we were like the next stage of cinematography. And the creative side was huge, trying to understand what was wrong with an image, how to balance it, trying to understand how to let the tools do what you want them to do. To me, what's exciting is using cinema in its full potential, which is rhythm and sound design and music. Our job is to set up expectations and then deliver on them. 
what gets me excited is coming up with sound ideas that do match picture, but also is not just the equivalent of what you're seeing on screen. Where else can the technology go? What else can we do? I'm very interested in trying to mold the image and create the best look possible. And whatever tools are out there, you want to try and latch onto them. I'm Brian Cates, and this is my course in film editing. I'm Eric Whip, and this is my course on color correction. I'm Eugene Garrity, and this is my course on sound design.